Good evening, this is Pastor Dexter Upshaw and welcome to our first edition of Throwback Tuesday. I'm so excited to be with you tonight. Throwback Tuesday is a new concept for our Transformation Tuesday, our midweek service. You know, we have multiple formats for our midweek service. Sometimes we have a glass table talk hosted by Pastor Lindsay. Other times we just have a worship night. Some nights, hey, it's standard preaching and worship. But tonight is special because I'm pulling from the archives. I'm going back in the time and grabbing a message where the Lord spoke very clearly back then, but I want to tie it into what God is doing in the life of our ministry and our church now. There's a few reasons for this. First off, I just love the word of the Lord, and there are times where God will speak and he will release a word, and we hear it for the first time, but we don't really absorb it. So I'm the type of preacher, the type of pastor, that I really do mark and I chronicle every single message that I've ever preached since 2000, probably 12. I have the notes from it. And to be honest with you, there are times where I will present concepts on a Sunday morning that become the basis, the foundation for future teachings and um, expositing over what we originally said. So this is a word that I could probably take, expound, go over again. So I thought it'd be helpful for you guys to listen to it again. The other reason why we're doing Throwback Tuesday tonight is because I wanted the sanctuary to rest. This beautiful sanctuary behind me has been a hot spot for revival. 10 days of prayer. We opened up our doors to the region. We had hundreds of people come into our sanctuary for worships. 10 nights of worship, prayer, altar calls, the supernatural showed up in our sanctuary. And we had some people who worked hard. They worked diligently. They served from the front desk to the parking lot, to the safety team, to the altar ministry. Some of our folks were responsible for leading worship. This guy right here was responsible for being the MC on certain nights and preaching. So I just decided that I wanted this Tuesday to rest. So we're online only. You are joining us from YouTube or for Facebook. So I want you to take a moment, share this message with friends and family. Tell them to tune in to Throwback Tuesday. And tonight we're going to watch a very special word. I preached this message in 2019. We had just gotten in the building. You'll notice that my hair is much shorter than it is now. You'll also notice that on the stage, uh, we didn't have as high quality equipment and audio as we do now. You'll even notice that there's no LED wall behind me. We had the old stage set up. But there was a word that I brought forth called provision test. And we talked about the importance of covenant, particularly when it comes to tithing. We did an exploration of the book of Malachi and the scripture that says, will a man rob God? This is a somewhat controversial text. And that Sunday, the Lord led me just to walk through it. And I feel like that service, um, we really got a better understanding of what it means to give God our first and our best. So we're going to watch it now, especially during the month of September, where we're talking about making a commitment to the house. So I pray that this word blesses you tonight. Provision test. Grab your notebook, take notes, but most importantly, make sure you make application from this word because I promise you, if you receive it, you open up your heart and you make changes to benefit the kingdom of God, God will bless you, bless your family, but most importantly, he will bless his work and the kingdom of God will expand through your partnership and your obedience to scripture. So without further ado, let's pop that tape into the VCR. Some of you don't even know what a VCR is. We're going to pretend. This is just pretend. It's a digital button. But just humor me for a second. Let's pop the VCR tape into the VCR. The VHS tape. That's what it's called. Let's pop the VHS tape into the VCR. And let's go back in the time. And let's watch this archived message. Throwback Tuesday. Pro Vision Test here at New Vision International Ministries. I am God. Yes, I am. I haven't changed. And because I haven't changed, you, the descendants of Jacob, haven't been destroyed. Can we just give a round of applause for the grace and mercy of God? You'll find out as we get into this passage that the children of Israel were tripping, but God's faithful when we're faithless. You have a long history of ignoring my commands. You haven't done a thing I told you. Return to me so that I can return to you, says God of the angel armies. You ask, but how do we return? Begin by being honest. 
Do honest people rob God? But you rob me day after day. You ask, how have you robbed me? The tithe and the offering, that's how. And now you're under a curse. Now he's speaking to the children of Israel back then. And we'll deal with that in just a second. But, but this is what he said to them. The whole lot of you, all of y'all, your whole nation is just messed up because you're robbing me. Bring your full tithe and to the temple treasury so that there will be ample provisions in my temple. Test me. Somebody say, test me. Now, this is God speaking to you, not you speaking to your neighbor. Some of y'all just got an edge. It's like, just test me. Try me now and see. See if I can be. <laughs> God is saying, test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. The word of the Lord in the church said, amen. amen. I want to speak today from the topic provision test provision test provision test you may be seated father i pray that you would begin this provision series with a bang with the depth of understanding and with a heart of worship lord would you speak to us through this text let us look at this scripture with fresh eyes but most importantly let us look at you with fresh eyes that as we return to you you'll return to us in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Many of you have been asking where my glasses are, and on Tuesday I confess to you that they're broken, and I'm waiting for a new pair to arrive. So in the meanwhile, I've been wearing contacts every day. The only problem is that I think my prescription has changed, and I can see well enough, but my eyes seem to be working harder than they need to be. So you know what that means, I need to schedule an appointment for the eye doctor. But if you're anything like me, then you drag your feet to go to the doctor. Is there anybody here who can sympathize with me? You know you need to go. But it's just something about going to the doctor because they want to run all these exams and all of these tests. You have to endure all of this stuff that they make you do once you go. And um, if you're anything like me, I don't like exams. I don't like tests. But that's what you have to go through when you go to the doctor. Whenever you go for an eye examination, here's what they do. Uh, an eye examination is a series of tests performed by an eye doctor. And these tests are designed to assess vision and the ability to focus and discern objects. All those different tests that they're doing to you when you go to the eye doctor, they are designed to assess your vision different types of eye tests you'll probably encounter when you go to the eye doctor. The most recognizable eye test is what they call the Snellen test. Somebody say Snellen. The Snellen test, that's where they have the letter, the big letter, and then the smaller letters, okay? That's designed to help identify whether or not you have 20-20 vision or 20-40 or 20-200 like some of us. The whole concept is that you stand 20 feet away from the chart and the smallest line that you read designates what your vision is. Now, 20-20 vision just means that you can see the words clearly. It deals with what we call your vision acuity, your ability to see something sharply. Then there's another test where they, y'all like this one, where they blow a puff of air in your eye. Isn't that weird? They hook you up to this cold machine and your forehead is on this bar. And then they say, all right, open your eyes really wide. And then they... Like they bust a cap in your eye. They just. <laughs> and the air is designed to test the pressure of your eye and to look out for signs of glaucoma. But the worst is when they dilate your pupils. Anybody ever been to that? You went to the eye doctor in the middle of the day on your lunch break and then you couldn't get back to work because you can't drive when your pupils are dilated. They put these drops in your eyes and then your pupil gets like this big, the size of a quarter. And everything is blurry and you're sensitive to light. And the whole point of them dilating your pupils is so that they can see all of your optical nerve and retina equipment so they can make sure that your eye is healthy. Now, here's the reality about examinations and tests. Although they are uncomfortable, they sometimes reveal what's wrong with you, which is why some of us don't like to go to the doctor because we don't like to be told what's wrong with us. But how many of you know that examination is important and so when we exercise wisdom we just bite the bullet 
We go to learn whatever we have to learn so that we can make adjustments. There are times when God will examine his people. There are times where he will perform a battery of tests on his people to see how faithful they are, how committed they are. He will, he will watch you from a distance to see how focused you are and your ability to discern his move. There are times when God will test and examine his people. And in the book of Malachi, we see God performing a test on the children of Israel. He is examining the people and he is rendering an assessment as to where they are and where their heart is. And the diagnosis is that there is a lot that needs to be corrected. At this time of history in the book of Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament for the New Testament, Israel is about 100 years removed from Babylonian captivity. They are living in Jerusalem. The temple has been rebuilt. But although they're no longer in captivity and although the temple has been rebuilt, the people's hearts have not changed. Now, those of you who are Bible students, you read about the children of Israel from Genesis through Malachi And you see that they tend to be a stubborn people whom we read in scripture. They fall in and out of grace with God. They would serve God wholeheartedly. They would enter into covenant agreement with God. And then they would start to do what surrounding nations were doing. They would begin to marry into other other religions and bring all types of cultist practices to, to pure places. And then God would hand them over to their enemies as a form of judgment that he would raise up. A judge raised up a deliverer to rescue them. And it was this cycle that we see all throughout the Old Testament. And here we see the children of Israel again at the very end of the Old Testament back in the same cycle. Now, here's the beautiful thing about Malachi. When you really study it, it's really pointing to the Redeemer that is to come. And the whole story of the Old Testament is just um, an observation that in ourselves we can't do it, which is why we need a Redeemer, which is why we need a Messiah, which is why eventually we had to step into the New Testament and John the Baptist had to make the way for someone who would come and finally solve this issue once and for all and establish a new covenant. And now all those who believe are engrafted into this promised people. You see that even in the book of Malachi. But here's what I want you to see in the book of Malachi. I need you to see the heart of the people, because as you look at their actions, you can see their heart. Sometimes you can see the heart of people flowing through their actions, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What they say and what they do is an indication of what they're all about. And when we read the book of Malachi, we see that the children of Israel are not about their father's business. The temple is rebuilt, but this new generation has proven to be corrupt and unfaithful to God. Not just the people, but also the priests. And they are corrupt in particular with their offerings and their sacrifices. Now, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were required to follow a fairly complicated tithing and offering system that we don't have to follow. Somebody say amen. Because they had different types of tithes and different types of offerings. And they lived in what we call an agrarian culture, which means that they were into farming. That's how they measured their wealth was through cattle and through grain and through commodities. And in that time, uh, commodities included animals, land, wheat, olive oil, wine, honey, fruit, and dough. Now, it was required for those chosen people to give the first and the best of their harvest, of their commodities, to the Lord. That was the covenant agreement that God made with his people. And when people received increase in those times, it was their responsibility to bring what we call first fruits. First fruits were first presented to God by bringing the offering to the priest at the tabernacle or the temple. They had to bring their first and their best offering. Animals and cattle were inspected by the priest before they were brought to the Lord. And the priest then took the offering on the first day of the week with arms outstretched and waved it before the Lord. Those gifts were utilized to take care of the priest and the Levites and the temple. Now, why did they give first fruits? They gave first fruits as a demonstration of their gratitude for what God had provided and their dependence on God himself. This was based on two spiritual principles related to stewardship, two premises. One, that all creation belongs to God. And the second premise is that therefore, because all creation belongs to God, then that means that the first and the best belong to him. The concept of stewardship is that we don't own nothing. Nothing as believers belongs to us, but we serve an almighty God who owns everything. That's the premise of stewardship. So it's not my house. It's the house that God has blessed me with. It's not my car. It's the car that God has blessed me with. 
Lord, thank you for this job. May I glorify you through it. Even when we receive children, we offer them back to the Lord, demonstrating that they do not belong to us, but we just steward them for 17 or 18 and nowadays 24, 25, 26 years. And then we give them back to the Lord. We're going to deal with that in a couple of more messages. Be not discouraged. All of it belongs to God. So when you're a believer, your language changes because you recognize from whom all of your blessings flow. They flow from the Father in heaven. So there is a spirit of gratitude that's attached to everything that we receive. So back then, tangibly and literally, they would give the first portion and the best portion to the Lord. So let's break it down this way. Let's say you had a whole bunch of cattle, ribs for days, steak for days, good steak. Not the steak that you get from Golden Corral, but the steak that you get from Ruth Chris. You haven't eaten steak until you go to a steakhouse. And the mindset was before I slaughter the best calf and give it to the Lord, I'm going to find, or rather before I, I, let me back up, before I, I make my ribs, I would find the best cow in the bunch and I will reserve that for the Lord, the best looking one, the one with the best meat, the best cut. And I would sacrifice that cattle first and offer it to the Lord, representing how I trusted God for the increase and believing that the same God who gave me more cattle is the same God who can give me more cattle. Therefore, the first and the best goes to him. OK, now all you have to do is think about what you reserve for yourself as the first and the best. And automatically that belongs to God. You know how some of us do. We get a plate of food. We get a, a bulk, you know, a, a bucket of chicken or whatever, and you're looking for the best piece. You, you, you get, when, when you go to the car lot to pick out your car, you don't want the car that's all dinged up. You want to find the best vehicle, right? When you're walking through the aisle of your favorite shopping store, you're looking for the best. When you go get your fruit, you're looking for the best because you want to bring the best home to you and yours. Now, when we give an offering to the Lord, we should look for the best. Now, in that Old Testament system, if you did not bring your best, the priests were supposed to stop you at the door and say, uh-uh, you need to go back and find a more appropriate sacrifice to the Lord. That's what was supposed to happen. But in those times of Malachi, not only were the people corrupt, but the priests were corrupt because they were overlooking things that they should not be overlooking. And they had all forgotten that we were supposed to be giving our first and our best to a holy God who demands the very best we can give him because he owns everything and it's only right that we give him the best. The people in Malachi were not bringing their best sacrifice. Just look at Malachi 1 and 7. This is what the Lord said to them. You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice... Is it not evil? When you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Now, what he's saying is, instead of you going and getting your best animal, you're bringing your blind animal that you wouldn't want to eat. You're bringing the sick one to offer to the Lord. Now, look, look, he goes deeper. The Lord says, why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you or would he receive you kindly? You, you wouldn't give that to your elected official. You wouldn't give that offering to your favorite celebrity. You wouldn't give that offering to your mama. You wouldn't serve that to anybody that came to your house. Do you see the mentality and the mindset? They were just giving God anything, and they'd, they'd give more honor to a man than they would God himself, and that's a problem. And you must understand that as a kingdom-minded person, you cannot give more honor to a person than you give to God. Fear not the one who can destroy body, but fear the one who can destroy both soul and body. We have to get to a place where we fear God in a healthy type of way. We're not talking about the type of fear that causes guilt and shame. We're talking about a reverence and a respect for the Lord. We must reverence the Lord in this hour. We must reverence the Lord. We must, we must reverence him. We must see him as holy 
and see the fact that we are allowed to come into his presence, even though we are unholy, as a privilege and an honor. It, it, it is a privilege and an honor for you to serve in his kingdom. It's a privilege and an honor for you to worship because he could have pushed you out. He could have rejected you, but yet he beckons you to come. But even in our proximity to him, we must never forget that our God is a holy God and a consuming fire. And they got it twisted. So they just started giving God some of anything and everything. You know when somebody doesn't give their best effort. You know. You know You know where they didn't put no love in the food. You know when they just slung something together. You know when they just stopped by the gas station before they came home to bring you something. You know what their capacity is. And then you match what they gave. And then you're scratching your head and saying, where's the love? You see when the flowers are wilted. And you know. And God is saying, you're, you're not giving your best. Whatever that best is, you're not giving it. In other words, they were bringing wax sacrifices to the Lord. So here's the question for all of us from the pulpit to the pews. What type of offering are you bringing to the Lord? Do you give more deference to man and to people, to your boss, to people whom you esteem highly in your life, family and friends? Some of us go all out to give a gift to those whom we love, yet there's no extravagance of what we give to God. And the question is, where is God on your list? Because if you give to him first, then he empowers you to give to others. See, the beauty is that when you learn how to be generous with God, it unlocks generosity in you for other people. Because after you've given to God your first and your best and you remind that it doesn't belong to you, he creates within you his spirit and his heart because the God whom we serve is a generous God. The God whom we serve is a generous provider. The God whom we serve is someone who gives to us so freely and so liberally. And when you get to know him, it's easy to love him. And out of that love relationship flows a generosity that blesses everyone around you. The question is, are we bringing a great sacrifice? Are we bringing a mediocre sacrifice? Are we bringing a whack sacrifice to the Lord? And that's something that only we can measure between us and God. But I can tell you this, that where your treasure is, that your heart is also. And you need to know that when we talk about biblical giving, it's always a matter of the heart. Always. Jesus was the one who said that where your treasure is, there your heart is. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth when, where rust and moth can destroy and thieves can steal. He said, you need to lay up treasures in heaven. And there has to be a mentality amongst the body of Christ where we love God so much that we demonstrate that love through tangible things, tangible gifts. When you see the early church in the book of Acts, they demonstrated their love for God and one another tangibly. Not just in terms of vocal service, but in terms of their demonstration of what they gave to God and what they gave to one another. We give out of a love relationship with our creator. We give our first and our best to say thank you for what God has provided. But the reality is that in Malachi, the children of Israel were ungrateful towards God. Now look at the remedy that God provided to Israel. Look at Malachi 3 and 7. It says, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But, but you say, how shall we return? Now, I want you to see the grace of an almighty God. He said, you tripping like your fathers were tripping. You've got this generational issue because you're acting just like your predecessors. But even in your foolishness, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you opportunity to return. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a pivot. I'm going to make an opportunity for you to come back to me. No, you have not kept my statutes. But because I love you so much, I'm going to tell you what you need to do and give you an opportunity to do it. Good parents love their kids enough to tell them what you want them to do, to express your disappointment in what they failed to do. But say, if you want to get this right, here's what you got to do. There's no guesswork in God. A good parent is not keeping you on your toes trying to get you to guess what the desire is. No, you spell it out nice and clear, don't you? Mama's in the house. Y'all know y'all spell it out nice and clear. Didn't I tell you to X, Y, and Z? I said I was going to be gone for three hours. I told you to wash the dishes. 
I told you to sweep the floor. I told you to vacuum the living room. I spelled it out for you, yet you chose to do what you wanted to do on your computer, on your phone, watching TV. You spell it out, don't you? Because you don't want there to be any confusion about what you said. No, I said, and then you got that photographic memory where you can recall and go back in the time to the specifics of what you said. I said X, Y, and Z. Next time, because you still are giving grace, because they're still your child, even though they're crazy, and they belong to you and look like you, even though they're crazy, and you still have a responsibility to raise them, even though they're crazy, so you give them another chance. If you, being evil, can do that for your kids, how much more do we serve a loving God who gives us chance and chance, time and time again? He said, y'all have not been doing what you're supposed to do, but, but I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to spell it out for you, and here's what you need to do. He said, I want you to return to me and I'll return to you. And you're asking, okay, how shall we return? Look at verse eight. This is what God says to the, the folks in the book of Malachi. He said, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And tithes and offerings. Now I want you to see once again, this was a heart issue. It was a heart issue issue. You see that in the corruption of the people and the corruption of the priest. It wasn't just about money. It was about the heart of the people and their lack of respect for God. It was about the heart of people and their casual relationship with God where they would just bring in anything instead of bringing something that was thoughtful as something that represented their first and their best. And so God gave the remedy to that people at that time. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, verse 9, you'll see the consequences that Israel was suffering. This is what that people at that time were suffering. Verse 9 says, you are cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. But bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Now, let's deal with this concept of robbing God. Okay. Now, God wasn't in heaven waiting for Israel to pay their tithe so he could go down to the bodega and get something to eat. Okay, let's just get that straight. God doesn't need your money. God's not waiting for you to cash app him so that he could pay his heavenly rent. He's got, he's eternally existent. He doesn't need our money, but he requests it. Did you get that? And so out of obedience, we give God what he asked for, because if we love him, we obey his commands. And so God's not not stressing out. He's not losing sleep because you don't give. But what he's trying to help us understand is that when you have a covenant relationship with the creator, there's certain benefits that flow into your life. When you learn how to trust him, there's certain things that flow into your life. When you learn how to give, it's actually helping you more than it's helping God. Don't you love that, parents? When you're trying to teach your kids something like I'm just trying to help you. I'm just trying to help you understand that, that if you get this, this will benefit you for the rest of your life. It's going to help you more than it helps me. And God is saying, you know what? I am the God of all creation. This is what I've requested. This is what I require. But, but ultimately, when you fail to give it, there are consequences that come into your life. Hope you know the IRS will come and find you. Won't they do it? Oh, they'll come and find you if they feel like you are holding on to what should have been withheld for them. They gangster with it, too. They're going to calculate down to the penny and come after you to get what they felt like belonged to you or belonged to them. But, but we serve a God in this dispensation who is so loving, so kind, so long-suffering. Aren't you glad that God has not doled out judgment according to our folly? Aren't you glad that when we mess up, God just doesn't say, I'm done with you? Aren't you glad that God demonstrates grace after grace after grace, even when we're not doing what we're supposed to do? But they were robbing God because they did not give to God what already belonged to them. Let me give you another example. Mama tells you to go to the store and buy some milk and some eggs. She gives you a $20 bill. Am I on somebody's street? You can't go and get the milk and the eggs. You can't go and get the milk and the eggs and then decide you're going to buy a candy bar with mama's money. What's she going to say when she comes back? When you come back, where's my, where's my change? That $20 did not belong to you. 
Now, if you ask me, I just might bless you. But, but that's my, my, so where's my change? When you go to the grocery store and you give a $20 bill and the, the bill was $16.45, you expect change to come back because that's, that's yours. If the cashier keeps it, it does not belong to him because that's your money. They have robbed you of what was yours because it didn't belong to them. And God is saying, I've given you life. I've given you health. I've given you strength. I bless you with that job that you were on the altar crying and starting about. I bless you with everything that you needed. You asked for transportation. I gave you a bus pass. I know you wanted a Maserati, but the bus gets you from where you need to go. I know you asked for steak, but you got hamburger helper. I know you asked for all of these accoutrements, but you haven't gone hungry yet because I have blessed you. I've taken care of you. Everything you have is because I gave it to you. That intellect that you have is because I gave it to you. I provided it for you. And you're robbing me when you withhold it. You can apply that to time, talent, and treasure. What are the gifts that God has placed in you that you will not give to him? You thought you went to college so you could get your degree, your master's degree, and be phenomenal in the workplace. Yes, but God wants to use that for the building of the kingdom. And if you're not using it for the building of the kingdom in some way, shape, form, or fashion, either through marketplace ministry or to bless the house, the question is, why would God bless you with it? If he blessed you to be a blessing, why aren't more people blessed? Because he gave it to you not just so you can bless your pockets, but so that you can be an ambassador for Christ, so that he could use you for the glory of God. We have to get back to the place where we recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. And if God has blessed me, it's only right that I give him a portion back of what already belongs to him. So he's saying to these people, y'all robbed me already. Why? Because you withheld what already belonged to me. The remedy? Bring the whole time. Now remember, they had an issue. They would bring the little crippled animals to the Lord. He said, bring the whole, bring the, bring the best, bring, bring the, the fattest portion, bring the best here into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. In order for the temple to run properly, the people were required to give so that ministry work could be done. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. But then it gets interesting because he says, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now, remember this passage started out with God examining Israel and testing Israel, but it finishes with God saying, test me. He's never lost a battle and he's never failed a test. (laughs) Y'all didn't hear what I said. God has never lost a battle and he's never failed a test. If he said, test me, then you best believe that his word never returns unto him void. If he says, test me, God is not like a man. God has never written a check that bounced. If he says, test me, he's faithful to do what he said he would do. If he says, test me, if he says, try me, then you best believe that whatever God says for you to test a man, he's well capable of accomplishing what he said. He says to the people at that time, Test me. You've been wayward in your giving and your offerings and your sacrifice. You've been bringing these little afflicted lambs and stuff to me. I'm giving you opportunity to get it right. Now try me. And watch me open the windows of heaven. Watch me remove the drought over your land. Watch me bring back your produce and your harvest. Watch me do exceedingly and abundantly. Watch me do an overflow in your life. Watch me. Started out with God examining Israel. It ended with God saying, test me. In other words, Israel, if you get back in order and bring your proper offering and sacrifice to me, he's saying, Israel, I will open up the windows of heaven and I will pour out a blessing until it overflows. And he takes it a step further in verse number 11. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you. All those locusts that have been coming in and eating your harvest and your crop, I will speak to the winds and I will speak to nature And because I'm God, I will keep the locusts from taking your harvest. There are certain things in our life that are outside of our control and above our pay grade, but we serve a God who's able to speak to hiring managers. We serve a God who's able to speak to debt counselors. I serve a God who is able to just with a wind and a blow and a breath of his word, open up doors that could not be opened. We serve a God who has the ability to rebuke the devourer. Tell the enemy to keep his hand off of my household and off my family. 
He has the ability to direct the enemy and say, no, 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 that's enough. Go on to another place, another time, because this is my beloved and my hand is on their life. He has the ability to rebuke the devourer on behalf of his people so that they will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will their vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, he speaks to Israel, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, at one point, you were not doing what you were supposed to do. At one point, you were failing to give to me what was due to me. At one point, I had a curse on your finances and on your stuff and the land Israel. But when you repent, when you turn, when you return to me, when you put things back in proper perspective and put things back in order, I will open up the windows of heaven. I will bless you with overflow. And on top of that, I will rebuke the devourer and people will look at you and call you blessed. You will be a blessed nation and a delightful land. Now, this is what God said to Israel in the book of Malachi. However, I believe that there are four lessons that we can apply to modern day given. Remember, he was speaking to a specific audience at a specific time. He was saying that to Israel. And I want to translate this to how we as believers should approach generosity in today's hour. Number one, first lesson. When we don't give our first and best, we are robbing God. When we don't give our first and our best, we are robbing God. We think we're getting ahead. Now, I want you to really think about this. When God blesses you with a paycheck, when he blesses you with increase, it is he who is giving you the blessing. If you're a believer, that's what you believe. God is the one who is providing. So for us to go after God has blessed us with additional money, blessed us with a salary and a paycheck, and then pay everybody else, Money is flowing. The key is that when we're out of order, it's not flowing to God first. That means we've given more honor to our car note. We've given more honor to our mortgage. We've given more honor to our entertainment. We've given more honor to the things that we deem important. And we're saying, God, you're not as important as these other things. And essentially, when we do not give of our first and our best to the Lord, we are robbing God of what belongs to him. You've got to see that when you don't give what God has, has so rightfully given you from his heart and we don't give back from our heart, we are literally withholding what rightfully belongs to God. The second lesson we learn from this passage is that sometimes we suffer financial consequences when we don't give properly. Sometimes we suffer financial consequences when we don't give properly. In this passage, the children of Israel received a curse because they did not do what God told them to do. Now, let me be clear. I don't believe that New Testament believers are under a curse because they don't tithe. Under God's grace, he loves us in spite of our shortcomings, and the blood of Jesus covers us. However, I believe that the principles of generosity remain true, and we think we're getting ahead when we don't give to God, but we might just be putting holes in our pockets, and God might just be blowing on our stuff. According to the book of Haggai, he did that with his people in order to return us to a trusting relationship with him. Some of us are wondering why we're not getting ahead. You've got all the spreadsheets. You've planned everything out, but it seems like the devourer is just taking over your finances. That's because we got to get back to a place of putting God first. And sometimes we're suffering consequences because of our disobedience. And the, we want to know what the worst is when we used to do it and then we stopped and we know what's right, but we still won't do what we know we're supposed to do. God is trying to bring us back to a place of trusting him with our provision, trusting him with our first and our best. Sometimes what we're dealing with is a spiritual issue that addresses our natural problems. And when you get your spiritual house in order, you'll be amazed how everything else in your house lines up. Let me give it to you this way. When you really start to worship, when you really start to study God's word, when you really take time in his presence, you'll be amazed at how your language changes with your spouse. You'll be amazed at the peace that enters into your home because of the prayer that you made at the altar. You'll be amazed that when you get your life right and you say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going there anymore. I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm declaring that I'm living totally and completely for God. You'll be amazed at how many benefits flow in strange places just simply because you got your life right. And yes, I know the enemy tries to ramp up when we start doing the right things for the Lord, but don't you forget that he can rebuke the devourer. 
Don't you forget that there are more surrounding us than are surrounding us. Don't you forget that God still is the God of heaven's armies and he's never lost a battle. And just because it seems like you have more opposition, don't you forget that God has a blessing that's greater than the opposition that's mounting up against you. When you get your spiritual life in order, get ready for other things to fall in line. I believe that. I believe that when I repent from doing something I'm not supposed to do, then God releases blessings in my life that would not come lest I was sensitive to the voice and the spirit of God. When we get our spiritual house in order, it affects everything in the natural. The third lesson from this scripture, the first step to financial recovery is to start giving our first and our best. You want to stop the bleeding? God was speaking to the children of Israel and saying, you know what? This is how you return to me. Start giving me what's due to me. And that will unlock blessings unseen. The first step to financial recovery as we deal with personal finances and stuff, you've got to get to a place where you trust God. You can trust that he's going to open doors, test him in it. And to be honest, most of the stuff that we're dealing with is stuff that we brought amongst ourselves because of our foolishness and our lack of planning. And that shouldn't be God's issue. But we should give to God first to reset our finances and to get them back in order, to give our first and our best. This is a matter of trust and obedience. It takes faith to give to God first and trust him for the rest of your bills. It takes faith for you to give to God first what belongs to him and to give it freely and cheerfully and trust that he will give you the strategies and the methods necessary to to work down that debt that you ran up last year. It takes faith. But this whole thing is about trusting an invisible God and believing that he's working on our behalf and believing that our obedience counts for something. For those of you who are in this place, of struggling financially, the first place that you start is by giving God of your first and your best. And God can bring you to a place where there is such a relief over your life. You've never known peace until you've given your tithe and given your offering and said, I'm going to let God fight my battles. You, you don't know peace, listen, until after you've done that and then God shows you another need to meet and you say, okay, this is a wild and crazy ride. I'm going to meet this need because the Lord told me to and now I'm going to rest in him. You don't know peace until you've gotten to a place where the only person you can trust is God himself. That's true peace. That's real faith. First step to financial recovery is giving God what is due to him. And number four, test God. And watch him prove faithful in provision and protection. Test him. In this scripture, he told the children of Israel to test me. I see when I open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. I believe that if he told Israel that he would rebuke the devourer for their sake, he's the same God. He declared it in the book of Malachi. I'm the same God. I'm the God of Jacob. He said that I am, don't forget that. And so if he did it back then, that he can do it today. And I believe that when we give of our first and our best, he is able to rebuke the devourer. He's able to hold some things back on your finances. All of a sudden, your budget starts working and you ain't got more money. All of a sudden, you were worried about your clothes wearing out. But it's like you got a fresh wardrobe and all you did was go swimming in your closet. All of a sudden, oh, Betsy, that little sound that was in your engine is gone and you didn't take it to the mechanic. And God just starts doing stuff to remind you I'm with you, to remind you that I've got your back, to remind you that I'm still looking after you, to remind you that I provide for you and not your job, to remind you that I'm still thinking about you and I've still got your back and I'm still looking after you. He told the children of Israel to test them. So I'm telling you today, test God. Watch him prove faithful in provision and protection. I know in my own life, I've watched God send money out of nowhere. There have been times when I've lost jobs unjustly. New boss comes in that knew not Joseph, knew Pharaoh, and you out of luck. Anybody ever been there before? Your first boss was wonderful, remarkable. I mean, you just had the favor of God on you, and then here comes somebody that don't know how wonderful you are. 
And all of a sudden, you, you, you're outside of the circle. You're not in the circle anymore. You're not in the circle of trust. And, and, and now you're in, a, you're in a precarious place because you're relying on this person for, for your income. Let me tell you something. You don't rely on people for your income. You rely on God for your income. You rely on him for your provision. I've been there. I've been in seasons in my life where I was making a whole lot of money, and then just out of the blue, contracts started falling. Doors started closing. But I was doing what God told me to do regarding ministry. Doors being shut out of the blue. Lord, I thought you were going to bless me. He said, I'm still blessing you even though you're broke because the blessing has nothing to do with your bank account. The blessing has to do with your covenant relationship with me. Watch me take care of you when you don't know how you're going to get taken care of. Watch me provide for you while your account is overdrafted. Because I know we all saved here. Nobody's ever had an overdraft on your account. <laughs> Listen, sometimes the overdraft comes from foolishness. And sometimes the overdraft comes because you just don't have enough income to live in this God forsaken place called Connecticut. But the place that was once God forsaken has now become the place where God dwells. And somehow supernaturally, the economy is going down. But God's still providing. God's still opening doors. God's still making a way out of no way. And the place that was forsaken has now become a blessed place because the anointing of God is on your life. And now he's doing something remarkable. And it doesn't make sense in the dollars and the cents. But you know that spiritually speaking, God is up to something. Come on, I'm trying to build your faith now. You didn't know that, that some of us have been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and still seen God be faithful. You didn't know that there are times where God will bless you out of the blue. Things that you did not expect will show up because of your trust in the Lord. And God will cause you to weep because you don't know how it happened you don't know how he spoke to the person to meet your need at that very moment, but you know it was God taking care of you. You know it was God providing for you. You know it was God looking after you because he's just that type of God. He takes care of his children and he provides time and time and time and time again. That's the God that we serve. Oh, we're shifting into worship now because you can't give to a God that you don't worship. In fact, our offering is a worship unto the Lord. The sacrifices and the offerings, they were deemed worship. They had to bring it to the priest to offer it in the temple and the holies of holies so that God would be pleased so that he would look down on that sacrifice and smile at what he saw. We're in worship now because your giving is an act of worship. Lord, I worship you and I serve you despite the fact that I'm underemployed and underemployed. I will continue to worship you. I will continue to serve you. I will continue to bless your name. I will continue to clap my hands. I'll continue to go into my pocket it might be the widow's might, but I'm giving it by faith. I'm giving because I love God and he loves me and he's never lost a battle and he's still taking care of me. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by him. Don't judge me by the clothes on my back. Don't judge me by the car that I drive. Don't judge me by my current job or employment situation. Just know that I have a father in heaven who's taking care of my needs. I'm not going to worry about what I'm going to eat or what I'm going to drink. Don't you worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 6. He clothes the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. How much more is he going to take care of his children? Abba Father is not a deadbeat daddy. He always pays his child support. In fact, he never left the house. He might be silent, but he promised never to leave us nor forsake us. You need to know that you serve a God who's not like your natural father. He doesn't miss a payment. In fact, he gives you exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can think, hope, and or imagine. We serve a God who is a provider. That's who he is. That's his nature. That's his character. That's his attributes. And we can't act like pagans running around like we don't know where our meal is going to come from. Because our Heavenly Father knows what we have need of. Everyone standing in this moment, we're getting ready to close. Abba Father was a declaration of the children of Israel because they believed that they had a personal relationship with Yahweh. The difference between the Jew and the Gentile in the early New Testament and the Gospels is that the Gentiles were considered pagans who did not have a relationship with the true God, Yahweh. 
as Jesus was saying, this relationship that I'm establishing, now the Gentile will be able to come into this relationship with the loving Father. But there's a distinction. We have a God who takes care of us because the same God that's taking care of you now is the same God that took care of the children of Israel and Malachi when they were wayward and the same God who took care of the children of Israel and Joshua when they were wayward and the same God who took care of the children of Israel and Genesis when they were wayward. He's the same God. He's still faithful. He's still taking care of his children. And believe it or not, he's taking care of you. So he says, test me. And watch him open the windows of heaven and pour out an overflow. 